Okay. okay, we should be good. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Roger Paul. And tonight we will continue our study on the Maratia worlds. Let's see if I can adjust my screen here just a little bit. And we're on section six, paragraph 30, the recorder and teachers. And that's on page 554.4. And everybody's going to think I'm weird tonight because I keep looking up. I have to look at the screen on my wall because my screen's not on. So. It's not on. No, it's just dark. I can't read it. Okay. So let's say a little prayer and we'll get started. Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight that we might study your wonderful revelation. We thank you for our many blessings and pray that you open our hearts and minds that we might remember a little bit of this and share it with others and be ready for the mansion world. We thank you. We give you the praise from your son, Michael Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. Okay. Hey, Gary. Hey, hey Gary. Okay. Recorders and teachers. Diane, why don't you start out tonight? Okay. Six, recorder teachers. These seraphim are the recorders of the borderland transactions of the spiritual and the physical, of the relationships of men and angels, of the Marantia transactions of the lower universe realms. They also serve as instructors regarding the efficient and effective techniques of fact recording. There is an artistry in the intelligent assembly and coordination of related data. And this art is heightened in collaboration with the celestial art artisans. And even the ascending mortals become thus affiliated with the recording seraphim. Can't hear you, Roger. It's unmute. Maybe that'll work better. Okay. Uh, the recorders and teachers, this is the, the seraphim that actually record everything that happens from the, the finite all the way up to the spiritual. Okay, and it's interesting here that they say they are the recorders of the borderland transactions. Do y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Of the spiritual and physical. So they record everything, doesn't matter what it is, in all relations of angels and men. Okay, all the way down to the lower universe realms. All right, and it's it's really amazing that every single thing that happens to every single being in all the universe is constantly being recorded. Think about that. That's a lot of recording and data to keep track of, and so you can imagine how many of these things there has to be, right? I have a question, oh, Robert. Oh, I do. Okay. Yeah. You you go ahead, Diane. Oh, okay. Uh, um, unmute there if you want. Yeah. Uh, if they have to record just like individuals, then they're all the people that you're related to and you have conversations with, they record everything that they do and they say to you also. Yeah, yeah. Everything they do and they say also. So in a, any relationship with another being is being recorded constantly, mm -hmm. all right? Remember in Defending Your Life there, they put everything on a screen? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much the way it is. Yeah. I mean, every, every reaction is recorded. Yeah. And I guess they can bring up any moment in time from the beginning of time till now. Now, the interesting part about that is this. Think about Jesus's life. If Jesus's life was recorded like this, like, they do everyone else when we get to the mansion worlds we'll actually be able to watch the entire life of jesus as it happened that's pretty impressive if you think about it pretty special. Well, you don't have to watch our own yeah that's right all right so and they also use the celestial artisans in association with this and it says here even ascending mortals uh, can become associated with the affiliated with the recording seraphim. So I guess if you think about it, the celestial artisans can work with these recorder teachers to make it more entertaining when you're reviewing this stuff, you know? So, I mean, it would make sense to me. Anyway. So, Roger. Yeah. 
it really doesn't make sense to me why they would record me taking a shower, washing my hands, going to the bathroom, watching a movie. Well, that's sleeping. not a personal relationship, though, Rodney. They only record things having to do with inner reaction with other beings. OK, so they wouldn't record you when you're in the shower or in the bathroom. So they basically they edit it. Yeah. Yeah. But so, right there. Yeah. Unless you're standing there talking to yourself in the mirror and it's important. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, what about lovemaking? That's I mean, that's a personal relationship. I am not sure that would be in the recording quote, quote realm. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it may be it, blacked out. It may be blacked out. And if it was, it would only be available to the two people involved or the one person involved in your by yourself. <laughs> well, yeah. for some reason, I I think that the gist of it is it's the stuff that you gain spiritually from. Well, it's just like the adjuster. It's only stuff that gives you uh, uh, spiritual benefit, right? Right. Yeah, in a relationship. yeah, Jane. Uh, if we only take with us the positive, isn't right. that what I heard somewhere along the line? You're exactly right. It, they only take you take with you only take with you those things that are, that are a positive. benefit, a benefit yeah. to you. Now think about it this way, though, Jane. Some things that are not completely positive benefit you too. Right. Correct. If it was a lesson. Yeah. Right. Uh, so those sort of things would have to be recorded also. Right. But, but they would have, I suppose so. Um, but it, this is going to get a, like, what about trivial little things? And um, well, what about certain words, let's say, that a human expresses? But then there is a correction of that. W would we have to relive it? No, I wouldn't think so. Because think it's, not, it's not something that benefits you or anyone else. For exactly. instance, yeah, for instance, if you have a bad habit of cussing, <laughs> my wife is laughing. <laughs> yeah, we're human, right? Yeah, we're human. I'm sure those things are not are probably either bleeped out or <laughs> it, it's not of importance. So it's not something you would you would want to record and keep for a million years, you know. Unless they wanted to look back and say, "Look at these stupid humans." Aren't they funny? <laughs> you know? Aren't they funny? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. So really, the intention of that is still. Uh, either because it is something in the future we could be uh, whatever that word Laugh is, la yeah, the creation yeah. part, yeah. Uh, or uh, it benefits you in some way. Something that benefits. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right. Just like you know, you remember when they talk about the thought adjuster, those things that are not of spiritual importance, they say fall away like scaffolding. Okay, so if that's the case, those sort of things you're talking about would fall away when you die. You wouldn't even remember them anymore. Right. Where? On yours? We're not recording them. On yours? I don't know why I And I don't have the audio part of it. So, so your recording is in. Yeah, all right, go ahead and start it. Start it up. No, just start it back up. So you didn't get the first part of the recording. I, no. Okay. Hey, Pat. Sounds like I'm crazy. You probably double clicked it and it clicked it on and on. More than likely. Yeah. All right. Did you go? Were you going to say something, Gary? No. Oh, okay. All right, so let's go on. Uh, Rodney, would you take the next one? Yes. The recorders of all the seraphic orders devote a certain amount of time to
to the education and training of the Marancha progressors. These angelic custodians of the facts of time are the ideal instructors of all fact seekers. Before leaving Jerusalem, you will become quite familiar with the history of Satania and its 619 inhabited worlds. And much of this story will be imparted by the seraphic recorders. Now it kind of makes you wonder how long it takes to, to uh, watch 619 worlds history. <laughs> Who well, we needs got YouTube? all the time in the world, so. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's, that's what, part of the studying. Yeah, that's right. Historical <laughs> study. History. History yeah. of Satania. History that's class. Right. That's right. It's very important, right? All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gary, I believe you're up. Uh, no, okay. no, no. I'm sorry. Jane's up first. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. These angels are all in the chain of recorders extending from the lowest to the highest custodians of the facts of time and the truths of eternity. Someday they will teach you to seek truth as well as fact, to expand your soul as well as your mind. Even now you should learn to water the garden of your heart as well as to seek for the dry sands of knowledge. Forms are valueless when lessons are learned. No chick may be had without the shell, and no shell is of any worth after the chick is hatched. But sometimes error is so great that its rectification by revelation would be fatal to those slowly emerging truths which are essential to its experiential overthrow. When children have their ideals, do not dislodge them, let them grow. And while you are learning to think as men, you should also be learning to pray as children. Okay. You can spend two hours on just this one paragraph. Going yes. through each and everything in it. But one thing I want to mention is this. There's a sentence here. It talks about but sometimes error is so great that its rectification by revelation would be fatal to those slowly emerging truths. You see that? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the explanation why Jesus never appeared in front of a large audience of a church, even up to now, and saying, you've got it all wrong. You need to read this book. <laughs> you know? I really think this is why, because we have been so immersed in error for so long that if you tried to straighten it out in one generation, it would be fatal to all generations following. It, huh? It You're saying, so Roger, we can't handle the truth. We can't handle the truth. That's yeah. right. That's exactly right. And so the truth has to be taught to us a little bit at a time. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's really what this book set out to do was to teach us a little bit at a time. And that's why you start from the beginning of the book and go all the way through it, because they take advanced techniques, advanced thoughts, and advanced patterns. And you take from the big and you move to the small through the book. And by the time you get to the end of the book, you've gone over all the big things, but you've also straightened out many of the small things that we've been in error about for centuries, you know? Roger? So, yeah. I read it backwards. I, most people do, Rodney. The fourth, and then the third, then yeah. the second, and then the first part. Yeah, most I people I say do. the forward for last. <laughs> yeah. Remember, Rodney, we, when, when we first started teaching, I mean, when I first started having 2011, I think it was, 
we started from the forward. You remember that? And I beat that forward to death the first time through. Most people were confused all the way through it. I know that. People kept telling me they were confused. They were confused. When we went back and did it in 2015, I believe it was. We could understand it a little more. You could understand it a little, little more. And that's because of the growth in between, you know, because we went to the forward. We went through all the papers on God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit all the creator sons and all that. And then we came back to the Ford again in 2015 and went back through it again. And then in 2019, if y'all don't, if y'all remember, I started at the Ford one more time and I laid it out as simple as any human being could make it. I really did. And if you listen to those tapes, it probably makes more sense now because I had learned how to relate those hard concepts better by then you know and if i taught taught it in 2030 i'd probably teach it so that everybody could understand it because i i could teach better so as i grew my teaching grew for the book right mm -hmm. but that's kind of what they're talking about here you know you can't throw the 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 shell out with with the chicken you know that was the shell, and then we had to develop the chicken over time, right? And that's the way it works. We can only take so much expansion of our knowledge and our truth at a time, because if not, it'll blow your mind. I mean, you know, it makes you crazy thinking about it all the time. Roger, we're, we just started, my mother and I, reading the fourth part, maybe the seventh time. Yeah. And it's interesting because I'll read a sentence and I'll think, wait a minute, that wasn't there before. Did, was that sentence? But there I, did someone yeah. sneak that in? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just, maybe because I didn't understand it enough yeah. that I was conscious of it. Yeah. I don't know. It's strange. Well, Millie can relate to this. When we used to read in groups, you know, in people's homes, uh, people have questions. It was always in the next paragraph, wasn't it, Millie? <laughs> Every oh yeah, time. I remember that. You know, you know, you have questions usually answered in the next paragraph, and that's the way okay. it was. But when you study the book over and over and over again, like we have, you know what's coming next because you remember it subconsciously. You just can't put it in words, you know. So uh, makes it interesting. But this, like I said, this paragraph you could spend hours and hours on uh, because there's some things like even now. Uh, you should learn to water the garden of your heart as well as to seek for the dry lands of knowledge. You could spend an hour on that just by itself. You know, you really could. All right, uh, Gary, would you take the next one for us, please? Okay. Law is life itself and not the rules of its conduct. Evil is a transgression of law not a violation of the rules of conduct pertaining to life, which is the law. Okay. Falsehood is not a matter of narr narration techniques, but something premeditated as a perversion of truth. The creation of new pictures out of old facts, the restatement of parental life in the lives of offspring, these are the artistic trumpets of truth, the shadow of a hair's turning, premeditated for an untruth purpose, the slightest twisting or perversion of that which is principle. This constitutes falseness. But the fetish of factualized truth, uh, fossilized truth, the iron band of so-called unchanged truth holds one blindly in a closed circuit of cold fact. One can be technically right as to fact and everlastingly wrong in the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, so how many hours you want to spend on this one? Yeah, really. That, that's This This is another one. Yes, These two paragraphs, they, it's like they took it out of 
uh, uh, this is this is a, a class in philosophy. You could spend hours and hours and hours on this, right? Mm -hmm. the, the point is this, all right? Laws are not written in stone. That's that's a big thing, okay? But falsehood or evil is taking something that is true and doing what? Rearranging it to make it seem like it's not, all right? That's a perversion of truth. And what they're talking about here is a premeditated perversion of truth. In other words, when, when we think everything is written as law, everything in life, it's really not. We live, we experience, we grow. We live, we experience, we grow. We live, we experience, we grow. You can't say this is the law of life and you have to stick with that law all the way through your life. Because number one, we're not perfect beings. So we're not going to do that, no matter how hard we try. But what we can do is take what we think is the best concepts of God's law and try to live with that as much as possible. And that will get us through to the next step. And that's the important thing here is, you know, if you get so bogged down in this stuff, you will have guilt to the point where you might as well go to the Catholic Church. Okay, because the Catholic Church loves to propagate guilt. They really do. That's how they control the parish. All right. They've been doing it for two, 2000 years. All right. And that's what this is about. You can't feel guilty about your life. You have to learn your lessons and move on. Because by learning your lessons, if you never move on, you get bogged down in the mire of guilt over and over and over again. And guess what you have to do if you get bogged down in this guilt? You have to go, what? Forget penance, right? That's what the Catholic Church decided. They want you to go in and, and confess all your sins to the, to the priest, right? And they give you penance and it's all okay. Well, in reality, it doesn't work that way. Sorry, Catholic Church. It doesn't work that way. You are forgiven of your sins before you even commit them. Okay? That's the whole point of being God, right? He can do that. That's the mercy of the Son. Okay? That's, these are all things they teach us in this book. All right? So what this book does is it frees us up from this paragraph. It really does. It frees us up from the fact that we can live our lives, do the best we possibly can, and move on and learn from it as long as we don't try to twist the truth and facts into something that it's not. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. is, it, is this paragraph some, some, can we summarize this paragraph as thou shalt not manipulate? Yeah, you could. <laughs> Explain yourself, Gary, what you're talking about. Well, I'm thinking, uh, okay, it says we have these certain truths. Um, uh, thou shalt not uh, commit adultery. Just take that one right, or something. Right, right, yeah. And uh, I don't know how to manipulate that, but uh, anyway, you take a certain truth, uh, thou shalt not steal, and then you say, well, I didn't steal it, I borrowed it. Okay. There you go. And that's why uh, that's, they, that's what you're talking about, manipulate. Or justification of and you do that with, that's not justified. Yeah, you can do that with anything, right? Anything yeah. whatsoever, right? The manipulation is part, part of the what? The premeditated perversion of truth. You see that? Mm -hmm. And that's what is wrong, all right? It's better to say, yeah, I did it. It was wrong. I'm sorry. Move on right? God forgives me. You know, that's, that's part of the problem of the whole dying on the cross concept, if you think about it. Because people have thought for 2,000 years that Christ died on the cross for our sins, right? That's what's been taught to us over and over and over again. In reality, Christ did not die on the cross for our sins. Our sins 
are forgiven. If our sins weren't for, forgiven, we would need what? A sacrifice. And we know from reading this book, no sacrifice is necessary to God. It never has been. You know, that's something that the Bedouins came up with and Moses came up with to, to do what? Take away the guilt, just like the Catholic Church. All right. Think about that. The Bedouins sacrificed animals so they didn't feel guilty about what they did wrong. Right. But well, wasn't the there a uh, uh, precedence in sacrificing animals from the other uh, so-called gods they had at the time they sacrificed something to appease the gods and so That's, this was kind of a natural transition into the yeah, Hebrews. But what really started it Gary was human sacrifice so they could eat each other that's what started this and people don't like to face that the barbarians the early men ate each other and they felt bad about eating their relatives and all these other people they would kill them that eat them they wouldn't cook them or anything that eat them raw it's gross it's disgusting. it's disgusting that's right but that's the way men started and so they decided they were feeling so bad guilty about killing all these people and eating them they come up with this concept of sacrifice all right if we sacrifice somewhere, someone, we sacrifice it to some god, then we can still kill them and eat them and not feel bad about it. Yeah, it's right. right. It's the god's fault. Yeah, it's, it's the god's fault. You know, just pass on the buck, as they say, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Justification, right? Rodney, you look like you're just dying to say something. Go ahead. Well, I am, actually. All right. I, I understand that um, Jesus was not a sacrifice. No. It didn't require a the sacrifice. shedding of his blood right. to cover our sins. Yeah. I'm cool with that. I even understood that when I was a kid yeah. growing up. I could see through that. But this is a question I have. Right. Only because my mother always asked me, and I can't answer her. Yeah. Why did he offer himself then? Because it was requirement of his bestowal to die a natural or a normal death like every other human being. Okay. And but why that way? It didn't have to be that way, Rodney. It just happened to work out that way, okay, because of the Jews, right? They wanted to get rid of him, and that's the way they got rid of people back then. Okay, well, so the he could have jumped, he could have fell off a cliff and died just like everybody else does because he was human, all right? That would have been acceptable too. The only thing the father required is he went through an entire life. He died like every other human to finish his bestowal and that's exactly what he did that's why he put up himself for the cross in other words it was his choice to go on the cross and die like all other people during that time i just okay. don't think that the book explains it well enough um that part they probably don't well i know that jesus said greater Love the no man than to die for, die his, for friend. his friend. That's right. I have a feeling it's not in the book, but perhaps it was time to put an end to human sacrifice in this planet. It was. That was that's part of it. And I, you know, that's although it doesn't state it in the book. Yeah, but you're too. It's true. Go ahead, Jane. You have a question. Uh, Roger, are you also kind of saying that Jesus did not interfere with the course of events as they were occurring? That's and exactly right. That's what I hear you saying is yes. he didn't manipulate. Not at all. He didn't interfere. Right. That was his natural life going on. 
right? Yes. Yeah. And since the Jews betrayed him and turned him over to Caesar, right? That was his natural course of life, that he would be tortured and he would be put on the cross to die. And he knew that, you know? And when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, okay? When he said, Father, I know all things are possible to you, right? If it would be possible, could this cup could pass me? And he got the answer, no, it's not possible. This is what all creator sons do. They experience life to the fullest. And part of his period in time when he was here, his experience of life to the fullest was to be crucified on the cross because that's the way they were going to murder him, okay? And he knew that. So he asked God the Father if this could be, he could pass this cup on, and God literally told him no. Well, actually, Roger, the, from reading the book, it says that he, he never really got a direct answer. No. But, but he but, was led to believe that was that, the Father's will. That was the Father's will, and he was going to he was going to follow the Father's will regardless of what it was, and that's the commitment we need to have, right? That's the whole lesson of the cross, right? We need to have the commitment that Jesus did, you know, following God's will. Didn't the fact that he, if I remember right, when he went to uh, Mount Hermon, I believe it was, mm -hmm. about the time he was baptized, right? The, uh, God said, you know, you can end this now if you want. Right. And Jesus said, I want to go on. You know, I got, you know, I want to experience more. Yeah. And so this whole af life after that is because of Jesus, to me, love of us. It was. And it was and, optional, right? Yeah, it really was it, optional. Yeah. Yeah. And now I think the uh, suffering on the clock uh, cross was consistent with trying to experience all that man experiences because uh, crucifixion on the cross is going to be the one of the worst deaths God can you know you can have I mean I yeah. it's unbelievable we can't imagine we can't even imagine it we really can't you know you know they've done studies in universities uh, especially religious studies uh, of what happens during the crucifixion it's the most horrible death you can let die of it really was uh it still is you know i'd rather have somebody <laughs> chop my head off than die on a cross because that'd oh, be I quick and easy you know so hmm. all right. but uh they the philippines have a ceremony in which yeah. people actually get nailed to the cross, or I don't know how they, they hang there. And they, I think they're going to do it for like 10, 15 minutes. And they got to yeah. take the people down. Yeah. Yeah. They still do it there, Gary. Did you have another question, Jane? You look like you. No, no. Contemplate. Very good. Yeah. Just listening. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Didn't mean to get off on that tangent there, but these things are important that we understand, you know. We have a creator son that's beyond, I mean, the love of our creator son's beyond comprehension. It really is. Um, and we, we lose some of it in just saying that he died on the cross for our sins. And all this blood washing stuff to me is gross. You know, when I sit and listen to these hymns that I'm washed in the blood and listen, I was guilty of this too. I was a Baptist. You know, I sat up and you know, sang all the songs and, you know, all the hymns and all that stuff washed in the blood and all that. And I look back on it and I think, how barbaric could have I been, you know, to do that? So been there, done that. Know what it's about. So, uh, okay, let's go on to the ministering reserves. And I think, Gary, you're up now. Or did you just I read? I just read, but I'll do it okay. again. No, no problem. Let's, let's let Millie read this one. Okay. Millie? Yes. do have one comment you said yes. going back to the laws are the rules are are not written in stone but i think some of them are <laughs> yeah some moses, of them literally were Millie. <laughs> i think moses brought us a tablet yeah yeah, yeah. 
they were written in stone. Okay. Really, I stand corrected. <laughs> Does that mean we can't interpret them? We can always interpret them, right? And you remember, Millie, in the book, it tells us that the, the laws were originally seven, right? And we ended up with 10, <laughs> so, uh, which is interesting okay. too. Here we go. Right. Ministering reverses. Reserves. Uh, I'm sorry, reserves. I do have a new prescription. I just haven't had new glasses made. A large core of all orders of the transition seraphim is held on the first mansion world. Next to the destiny guardians, these transition ministers draw the nearest to humans of all orders of seraphim, and many of your leisure moments will be spent with them. Oh, oh nice. Angels take delight in service and when unassigned, often minister as volunteers. The soul of many an, an ascending mortal has for the first time been kindled by the divine fire of the will to serve through personal friendship with the volunteer servers of the seraphic reserves. So you want some friends, this is where to get them, right? The ministering reserves. These are angels that's going to help us along all through our, our experience. And they will become true friends uh, to us in the process. Now I've got a cat on asleep on my keyboard. <laughs> all right. No. <laughs> well, I guess I could. Do y'all want to see my cat asleep on my keyboard? Can you see that? <laughs> that's cute. All right, let's keep going. Diane, would you take the next one, please? Dear? Yeah. From them, you will learn to let pressure develop stability and certainty, to be faithful and earnest, and with all, with, with all, with, with all, cheerful, to accept challenges without complaint, and to face difficulties and uncertainties without fear. They will ask, if you fail, will you rise indomitably to try again? If you succeed, will you maintain a well-balanced poise, a stabilized and spiritualized attitude throughout every effort in the long struggle to break the fetters of material inertia, to attain the freedom of spirit existence? Okay, y'all. So if you want an easy way of it, this is not the way to go, is it? Okay. It tells us right here that if you fail, will you try again? So these struggles we're going to have in the mansion world are real. And they will be uh, they will be hard to get through them, right? Just like it is in this life. So uh, the question is, if you fail, will you rise again and try again? You know, do you have stamina, spiritual stamina to be able to do these things? I think that's important. You know, they also take away the celebration in the end, uh, in the field once you create it. So it's my understanding. They don't want you to say, hey, I made it, you know, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, everybody will eventually make it. So <laughs> get over it, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Rodney, would you take the next one? Yes. Even as mortals, so have these angels been father to many disappointments. And they will point out that sometimes your most disappointing disappointments have become your greatest blessings. Sometimes the planting of a seed necessitates its death, the death of your fondest hopes before it can be reborn to bear the fruits of new life and new opportunity. And from them, you will learn to suffer less through sorrow and disappointment. First, by making fewer personal plans concerning other personalities. <clears throat> and then by accepting your lot when you have faithfully performed your duty. So it's a process, isn't it, right? We have to uh, 
be aware that we're going to disappoint. Uh, we're going to fail at times in some things, and we're going to have disappointments in the mansion worlds just like we do here, right? And sometimes these disappointments, sometimes our dreams have to die for us to, to keep going on and grow new and better dreams, right? Roger, uh, I've read in other parts of this book where, oh, wait, uh, where I've read over and over to make fewer personal plans concerning other personalities. Persons, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Almost thank as you, if you need. You, thank you. I hit right on that. I know how many times my dad would say, no, 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 let me tell you, let me tell you this is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to do it. This is, don't, don't do that. Do it this way. He was <laughs> always planning our futures, which had nothing to do with what we wanted to do. Right. And I, I, there are lots of dads like that. There are lots of parents out there that push, push, yeah. push their yeah. child to do what they want them to do, not yeah. ask the child what they would like to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You have to decide. My, cho my children found their way. They, you know, it, yeah. it took a little swapping around. George started at, at Georgia Tech and ended up at Georgia State in the, as mm -hmm. a professor of literature. Jennifer started off as a uh, journalism teacher, a journalism major in at Georgia, and ended up with an engineering degree. So. <laughs> So he, Never know. she's the engineer and he's the he's the English professor. Yeah. <laughs> they they found their way. And yeah. we just sat back and said, oh my God, two more years. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, we, you don't, we don't people? have we don't have student debt, you know, back then yeah. it was not so much necessary to take these enormous loans. And yeah. they were um, state schools. Yeah, even be though grateful we for that, right? Yeah, definitely. Okay, Jane, will you take the next one? Yes, certainly. You will learn that you increase your burdens and decrease the likelihood of success by taking yourself too seriously. Nothing can take precedence over the work of your status sphere, this world or the next. Very important is the work of preparation for the next higher sphere but nothing equals the importance of the work of the world in which you are actually living. But though the work is important, the self is not. When you feel important, you lose energy to the wear and tear of ego dignity so that there is little energy left to do the work. Self-importance, not working importance, exhaust immature creatures. It is the self element that exhausts, not the effort to achieve. You can do important work if you do not become self-important. You can do several things as easily as one if you leave yourself out. Variety is restful. Monotony is what wears and exhausts. Day after day is a light, just life or the alternative of death. Hmm. Oh man, there's lots of wisdom in this paragraph, isn't there? Yes. Right. You notice here that one of the themes is not taking yourself too seriously. You see that? You're not important. It's the work that's important. It's important that you do the work in this world as this world to prepare you for the next world right and that's what i like to think that we do on tuesday and thursday night we're doing the work of this world right learning in this world so that we'll be prepared when we make the step to the next world right and we all know the importance of not becoming over self to self important we've gone through this over and over and over again Individually, we don't mean a whole lot, but as a group, we mean a lot, right? It's the group and the way we learn and the way we share with each other and help each other along that makes the difference, right? Not self, not ego, right? And I think I'd be, no, please don't change my screen. <laughs> uh, okay, let me see where I was. 
You know, Roger, when we talked with uh, the guy from um, Federal Express today, or from um, yeah, we, that was exactly what we were discussing. Yes, it was. Yeah, we got a uh, opportunity to witness a little bit today to our FedEx driver, and it was delightful. Okay, here we go. I think you've gone too far. Now this is our next paragraph. This is the one we just, just did right there. Yes. Self-importance, okay. All right. Here we go, Maraja Moda. How are we doing on time? Okay, we can get a couple more paragraphs in here. Seven, Maraja Moda. Gary, would you take that first paragraph? Okay. Uh... The lower plains of Maracha, Moda, join directly with the higher levels of human philosophy. On the first mansion world, it is the practice, it is the practice of, to teach the less advanced students by the parallel technique. That is, in one column are presented the more simple concepts of uh, Moda meaning and in the opposite column, citation is uh, made of analogous statements of mortal philosophy. Okay, and we're going to go through a list here in a minute that kind of shows how this works. Uh, although, I'm oh, sorry, y'all, I didn't even realize my camera wasn't up there anymore. Uh, my cat's giving me fits here today. Okay. And we're going to see this later on in this, this, this section of this paper. They only give us the philosophy part, though, not the most part, unfortunately. I don't guess they're, they think we're ready for it. Okay, so here we go. Let's go on to the next one. Millie, would you take the next paragraph, please? Yeah. Not, not long, yeah. Not long since, while excluding while ex executing an assignment on the first mansion world of Centania, I had occasion to observe this method of teaching. And though, <coughs> excuse me, I may not have undertaken to present the motor, which this Marantia instructor was, instructor was utilizing as illustrative uh, paternal design to assist these new mansion world sojourners in the early efforts to grasp the significance and meaning of Moda, these illustrations of human philosophy were. Okay, and this is, this is, uh, all, these are all human philosophy. I believe there's 28 of them, if I remember correctly. Yes. All right, and these are the human side of a list, and just next to it would be the Moda side. But it's kind of interesting to read through these and uh, kind of let it sink in a little bit. So let's just, let's, we got, how much time? We got 10 minutes, we might be able Should to- Should we try and guess the motor? We could, yeah. uh, if y'all want to, let's, let's take the first one here, uh, Roger, Diane. Roger, yeah. Roger, would you, yeah, thank you. Just keep your arrow off the uh, written word. Oh, you, okay. When your arrow's on, on, the, on the paper, on, the, on top of a word, sometimes I can't see what the can't word is. Can't see it? Okay. All right. I'll try to do that. Remind me if I do it again, Nellie. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, Diane, would you take the first one? One, a display of specialized skill does not signify possession of spiritual capacity. Cleverness is not a substitute for true character. Oh, good. Anybody want to guess what that might mean? Authenticity, I don't know. Authenticity, yeah, that would be a good good one, Jane, being authentic, right? Um, just because you can display a skill uh, that you have uh, does not necessarily mean you have the spiritual capacity for understanding what you're trying to say, right? All right. That's why they say cleverness is not a substitute for true character. So someone with true character may just explain or show you something in a skillful manner that would be different than someone that does not really have the spiritual capacity for that. Make sense? All right. 
have to live up to your own standards, really. Live up to faith. All right, uh, Rodney, would you take the next one? Uh, two. <laughs> few, few persons live up to the faith which they really have. Unreasoned fear is a master intellectual fraud practiced upon the evolving mortal soul. Defending your life. That's what this whole movie was about, is this second one. Mm -hmm. Right? Remember the yeah. movie? Mm -hmm. He was afraid of everything. So he was letting his fear, unreasoned fear, control him rather than having faith and living up to his true faith that he really had. Make sense? Yes. Perfect lesson. You're talking about that there. Uh, Movie. Yeah. yeah the uh, Fending your uh, life. Defending your life. You. Yeah. 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 That's what's that about. It's all about fear, right? People's fear. All right. Uh, Jane, would you take the next one? Three. <clears throat> Inherent capacities cannot be exceeded. A pint can never hold a cord. The spirit concept cannot be mechanically forced into the material memory mold. Okay, so some people are ready for spiritual concepts, right? And some people aren't, right? That's just the way it is. You can't force things into people. Some people are not ready for the book, are they? And some people yeah. are. If you try to force it on them, it will not work, right? Go ahead, Jean. So, you know, there is also, I get from this one is the limit of capacity. Yes. So one could hold the size of a timbal. Another one could hold an eight ounce glass. Mm -hmm. you, you know, the capacity... We are not all born with the same capacity, but full is full. Uh -huh. So if it's a gallon and it's full, it's full. If it's a quart and it's full, it's full, it's full. to yeah. full sufficiency. And with that, Jane, comes the concept of this. If you were born with the capacity of a thimble, right? Yes. And you go through life with your thimble full, you are ready to go on to the mansion world, to the next step right wow yeah because that's your capacity but if you were born with a capacity of a gallon and you walk around in your life with only a thimble you're not living up to your capacity right roger yeah can i make a comment please Rodney. that's a really interesting uh statement there to me, it's, it, it explains that has, you need mind, you need to um, be taught to open your mind. The more yes. you learn about it, using mind, the better you're able to comprehend, which allows more spirit. Um, that's exactly right. right so Rodney if you start with a thimble all right and you expand your mind you expand your material horizons right you might be able to as Jane said hold an eight ounce glass you if you expand your horizons even more you might be able to hold a gallon and if you expand your horizons even more and become even more spiritual you might hold a 50 gallon you know or an ocean full or an ocean full it's really up to us but the fact is that you can go around with the thimble your entire life and make it to the mansion worlds and be ready to go on to the next level so we can't put people down if they can't hold what we have to teach them you can't force enlightenment People uh, have to want to enlighten themselves. Through experience. Through experience. I think that's true. That's just the way it is, right? I don't want to de delay or belabor, but can I um, ask an example if Jesus was referring to this? And I don't know 
if this parable is in the Urantia book. So if it isn't, you, you could stop me at the get-go. Uh, but you know, there is that parable where there were the workers lined out outside. Yes. And, uh, the fir- and he, he told them, the master, this is what you're going to get paid for the day's work. Mm-hmm. Right. And so some go early in the morning, do the day's work, they get paid. Right. The last one only goes in at the last hour, yes. but he gets paid just the same amount. That's a perfect example, Jane. Perfect. It really is. That's, that's an example of what they're talking about right here, right? Because the guy that came in in the first thing in the morning, he could probably hold a gallon, you know, because he was prepared. He was there. He wanted to work. But the guy that came in the last minute, may have been the thimble guy you know but he worked to his full for his capacity so he get got paid what the full amount right because god is good does not discriminate that's exactly right perfect example and we're gonna we're gonna stop on that one tonight i think that's a perfect place to stop now everyone i talked to uh Rodney and Jane, before we started tonight, I have to go get a MRI to a Thursday. So, and it's in the late afternoon. I am going to do everything humanly possible to be, be back to start the meeting at six o'clock. Okay. So we're going to plan on having the meeting. If you don't see me here by five or six after six, it's because I didn't make it back. Okay. So let's plan on being here because I hate to interrupt this for this long a period of time. All right. So we'll plan on meeting Thursday and we're going to do our done just to get back home in time to take care of it. All right. So let's have a little prayer. We'll <coughs> quit for tonight. Uh, whew, man, who, who would like to pray? I'm out of breath. Millie, would you like to pray for us tonight? I'll do that. All right. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for letting us gather again today to try and understand some more of your revelation. And it's very good for us to see how things that you said are things that we already know in our own strange language and help us to interpret your rules and, and, and the things that you would like for us to do and how you would like for us to, to act and react Help us to understand how you would like us to do that. Those of us who have the capacity to understand this, we thank you for that. And for those of us who have less capacity and are struggling to understand this, we thank you for that too. And we ask that you help us pass this along to our friends who are not as intellectually stimulated as we are and need to be. They they need to be. Help us to stimulate them to try and grasp the concepts in this wonderful new revelation. We thank you. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. David Nevedon, thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you at home for joining us. Please come see us again. Thank you all. Thank you.